partly because it was aligned with religiosity. I think that was part of the hesitance. And clinician, physicians in particular, I don't wanna say all clinicians, but were academics were nervous about having religion be part of any topic for a variety of reasons. And, um, but we really, over the years, defined it pretty broadly, which I'll, I'll get into. And our, our goal really was to try eventually to create an innovative model that was more whole person based, um, including the spiritual health, not just the biopsychosocial um, health, but the spiritual health as well. And what I mentioned this morning, and I think is really, really timely now with, fortunately, the, um, the work around respecting diversity and, and equity and inclusion is that we do really need to be honoring people's cultural religious beliefs, if, if that's what it is, that's usually under culture, but also spiritual and what gives people meaning and purpose and listening to their complete story. Um, that's just respectful care. Um, so next slide. You can you just, if you want to operate it, that's okay. No, it worked this morning. Let's see if that. Just so I get a sense. So how many of you are with the spiritual care department chaplains? And then others, yeah. your, your chaplain? Oh, children, so pediatric chaplain. Yay, that's so important. Um, have I met you before you look really familiar? Yeah. Was it in, where were you? Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Nice to see you again. And others of you who are, who are who's here besides chaplains? I, get, I don't want to get to hear from the online people, but. Spiritual care, wonderful. So um, I mentioned the elective course that was in 92. In 95, when I was a resident, we um, looked at uh, award programs in spirituality and health, and that was with Dr. David Larson. So at that time, what was going on in academia with regard to spirituality, it was religion and health mostly, and it was around psychology. Yeah, okay. so that's where a lot of the research was going on around psychology, psychiatry, and religion. And, um, and then we broadened that a little bit to primary care. And then we did broaden our definition of spirituality, which happened when in 1999, we worked with the Association of American Medical Colleges, Brownie Anderson, if you remember her, Jackie, she um, was really interested in this area. We brought together um, deans and a small group of deans and others who had an interest in this area. And we developed a definition with regard to education as well as learning objectives. And that became the basis of many of the courses that have developed around the country. We did a study about five years ago and found about 78%, I think I have it on a slide, have, have uh, topics related to spirituality and health. Um, then in 2009, we developed guidelines in palliative care. And then um, we had comp national competencies that I did with Dr. Jim Blatt, who Jackie will remember, um, and we'll cover that as well, reflection rounds, and then our current uh, interprofessional spiritual care education curriculum and a new initiative we have that involves research. So this was our first elective and we define spirituality very broadly. That's a picture of my cats, my current cats, but um, there is quite a lot of writing around, around spirituality and pets and animals. And, um, and, but we covered everything. So spiritual practices, nature, there was um, spiritual health research up in the Harold Koenig's book. So that, that was, uh, we also looked at what the research was at that time, um, wellness. So really in different faith traditions as well. So we, we covered everything. Um, humor, the person juggling in the middle. We also talked about the, the spirituality of, of humor, which comes from a word seleg, which is actually holy. And so that uh, people can correct me with that, but that's what a, a, a leader in, in uh, spirituality talked to me about that humor can be a, a, a sense of joy and meaning. And, and so we, we did that through, through juggling. So broadly defined and, and um, the, the one in Jackie, may you may remember this, but we had one of my classmates who's Jewish had said that he was reluctant or nervous to go to Holy Cross Hospital, which was Catholic. Of course, everybody, all hospitals are accepting every patient. It wasn't only Catholic patients, but it was a Catholic hospital. And in our elective, he said what he found in rotating in that hospital was that there was that sense of respect of whole, the whole person. 
So not, not religion so much, but that respect of the whole person. So that was the beginning. And then when we look at a whole person care, so we're not the first people to talk about it. Uh, Paul Tournier, I don't know if how many of you know his work. Yeah, so uh, in 1964, he published The Whole Person in a Broken World and very much included religion and spirituality in that. And that led to groups called Medicine and Ministry, which at that time were physicians and clergy meeting together. Um, and in the, his work was out before that published book. So in the United States in the mid fifties, I think it was early fifties, there were two places that, that those groups were beginning to form. One was in South Carolina and one was in California. So we'll go back actually. So oh, whoops. So one was in um, South Carolina and one was in California. The California group became more of a new age things, but South Carolina you know, continued. I spoke to them twice. They broadened beside You're me. okay, stop whining. <laughs> it broadened be between physicians and clergy to any clinicians and chaplains and others. So it really got to be very broad by the time I spoke to them. And then they asked me to do their end of life. So they, they were at 50 years, which was 2020, they were closing the group. We couldn't have a meeting then. So we did it this past year, um, incredible group. And they, they did talk about whole person, including a spiritual domain, as did Cecily Saunders, who described total pain in palliative care and hospice. And then uh, when I was a medical student, we talked about whole person Engels model, which was a biopsychosocial, notably spirituality was absent. And then in 2009, um, in 2009, let's see, let me look at one more. Can we advance it one more? So in 2009, uh, that's when Dr. Betty Farrell, I don't know how many of you know her work probably online. I'm gonna guess many of the palliative care people do. She's a, a nurse leader in palliative care. Um, close friend and a collaborator. So in 2009, we developed the sort of national competencies um, in, in spirituality and health. And those include, as they're not going to actually call them, interprofessional spiritual care guidelines. And that's where we highlighted what Cecily Saunders did, which is to include the spiritual domain in care. Um, so let's see. You want to just put it up and advance the slides? That's okay too. That's okay. Yeah, right there, that's perfect. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so are you, yeah, ne next slide and just stay on that next slide. That's great, right there. And then, um, Margaret Hubner in Europe, um, in the Netherlands, was working on a whole person care model in order to, to change the definition in the World Health Organization. Their 1946 definition does not include the spiritual domain. It's, and it's her, her, her point in doing this new conference was that people were living longer. So absence of disease as a, as a definition of health wasn't really relevant anymore. So she started to change that to be that would even if you have a chronic condition that you can function according to, to the best way that you can. So you're not just seen as you know ill. Um, and then she also included a more existential um, part of uh, spirituality as finding meaning, purpose and a sense of fulfillment. And then we worked um, on a global conference. We took what we found in 2009 and also in Geneva, Switzerland, we not with the WHO, but we did that our many colleagues from there attended to look at how these, the models that we developed for palliative care might also apply to whole person care in general. Because of course, everybody can be dealing with serious illness or things in their life that are not necessarily end of life. And it's important to be able to look at that. And currently, even the dean of my, my the new dean, um, Barbara Bass at, at our university is talking about it, spiritual health as a requirement of person-centered care and how we, uh, the data that we need to be able to get there. So this was the definition in with double AMC 
And what you can see is it's, um, it's broad. Uh, it it's, was first lodged as a factor that contributes to health. So it wasn't just around end of life care or palliative care. Um, that spirituality is found everywhere in cultures and societies, and it can be expressed as a person's search for ultimate meaning through participation religion, in religion and or belief in God, family, naturalism, rationalism, humanism, and the arts. So the intent of that being that it's not just around religion, but what, um, and it was Professor O'Donnell from Dartmouth who said, who added this part that these factors can influence how patients and healthcare professionals perceive health and illness, but also how we interact with one another. So how um, from the morning, some of you were here for the morning presentation, how our own spirituality, what gives us meaning and purpose uh, is, is, a, is a way of how we can connect with being compassionate and present with our patients. Um, the outcome goals for the courses, as Brownie Anderson said, when they're walking across the stage getting their diploma, would be that by the end of that four-year period, they would be aware of the need to incorporate spirituality into the care of patients in a wide variety of contexts, recognize their own spirituality might affect the ways they relate to and provide care to patients, and then be aware of the biopsychosocial spiritual model, in essence, that you not only responding to the physical needs that occur at the end of life and in life in any illness, but also the emotional, social, cultural, and spiritual needs. So that was in 99. And um, this is kind of an overview of how we integrated spirituality at GW and um, at George Washington University Medical School and, and is similar to a lot of the programs around the country. So in terms of patient care, looking at spiritual history taking, um, looking and one of the things that I did early on was to identify spirituality as distress. I'm not the only one that did that, but within the medical environment for a very simple reason. When I, I shared this with my colleagues, they said, well, what's really our role other than that it's a nice thing to learn about, but we don't have anything to do with it, but we do actually, because we do, we are supposed to identify the biopsychosocial spiritual distress as well as health. And so that's where, you know, we linked it for training in that area and the assessment and plan and then compassionate presence um, to person's sufferings. And then we also, then Dr. Blatt and I also developed um, a way to integrate our own spirituality into a sort of clinician formation. So what's our inner life focus? You know, the word spirituality has raised so many issues over the years as to, is it religion, is it not? Uh, Dr. Black really likes that inner life focus, um, although he's moving more to understanding that it's that meaning, purpose, and call to serve, authenticity, and then compassionate presence to self as well as to patients. So um, important to be looking at that as part of professional development. Now, we also, over the years, have looked at we were not the only one doing something like this. It was that we were very much focusing on spiritual care, which was not, not um, done by other uh, specialties or disciplines. But I already talked about whole person care as lodging it in that frame, but the humanities very much had a, an interest in sort of the spiritual uh, dimension. Um, I'm a co-editor of a section in Journal of Pain and Symptom Management that used to be called Humanities, but it broadened to language, art, and spirituality because of all of these discussions around what, what falls under these umbrellas. Uh, Harvey Chachanoff has done incredible work with dignity therapy, center therapy, and Bill Breitbart um, has done meaning-oriented therapy. I don't know how many of you know of those, but especially in, in Bill Breitbart's work, there is a session on spiritual meaning. It's for cancer patients. It's an eight session therapy session, usually run by a therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, and it's you know very good outcomes. It's now been tested in other countries as well. So wellness is another part of, of, um, that has a, a thread around spirituality, compassionate care. And then of course, within palliative care and family medicine, those were the two fields that were most receptive to this when we started the work. Um, Though, so, uh, you know, I have to say, I, I, I've always been saying so the medicine is leading in this. In fact, at my own university, I'm, um, I've started a spiritual health group at the dean's request. And the first person that joined is an anesthesiologist. So always learning to be a little humble about our, our assumptions, but many people are now interested in, in this area. So this is actually a slide that was taken, uh, that was taken 
September of last year. So I teach um, a course, I teach in a course called Practice of Medicine. That's now a coaching model, but it's basically the same thing. And in the first, right, first course they ever take, right after orientation, they meet a, a case called Oliver Mann. So Jim Black did publish on this. It's a great case. And there are three different colors of Oliver Mann, red, blue, and green, I think it is. And they all have colon cancer, but a different stage, different ages, and then different psychological aspects, social and spiritual, as we put there, broadly defined. So the biomedical is different for each one, as is those other, are those other domains. They break up into groups. They don't know about the other cases. And then they have to say, um, with, their, with, the, with the decisions that patients make, what did yellow Oliver Mann say? What, and so a lot of these are around, um, you know, so patient with advanced decisions, a disease might opt for no further treatment or hospice. So there's a wide range, but the very first day of school, they start thinking about this whole area of whole person care. Um, so it is now integrated, as I said, as part of whole person care. We are looking at spiritual health, not just in patients and students, but residents, and particularly uh, the pandemic has shifted a lot of the interest into, um, into spiritual health for clinicians. Um, I, I remember in 2020, I went back to, I did not work in the hospital, I worked in the outpatient setting, but my colleagues who worked in the outpatient setting were just so distressed that there were no chaplains. We don't have a lot of chaplains at GW. Where is that chaplain? We really needed them. So that, that notion of chaplains also providing staff support, which not many people recognize as part of their main role. And um, assessment, et cetera. And we have it across in different sections. So breaking bad news and, and, and they, they learn about spirituality in their wellness section of the curriculum. So 95 to 07, we did the medical school curricular awards in residency and internal medicine. By 2011, we had data that 75% had integrated the spirituality topics. And this was largely influenced by the, the, uh, the trend in medical school in the late 90s and around this time, which was to have things integrated, not standalone courses. So a number of our awards programs did do electives but they didn't move out beyond the elective, only the students that came into the elective. So the idea was to have things integrated. And for those of you that teach, know that when you integrate something, you have less of it, but it's more integrated in, the, in a concept of addressing the whole person. So I, I actually think it's better to do it that way. This was the conference I did with Dr. Betty Farrell and she and I published a book called Making Healthcare Whole, Integrating Spirituality into, into Patient Care. And then at that conference, in California, which was a US conference, we had a definition of spirituality. And I mentioned that we then went on and did something a couple of years later uh, with a global, more diverse uh, participation. And so this definition was done through policy Delphi, very rigorous analysis, then consensus uh, process at in person at the meeting. And um, people, I mean, to me, this was really interesting in how people understand spirituality in different places. So for example, the word society, the facility, we got down to a definition, people skipped dinner to get this right. It was, they were that passionate about this. Again, interdisciplinary, very different backgrounds. And um, the group from Australia said, we, we will not sacrifice the word society because for us, the indigenous peoples are what is the root of our sacredness. And so really learning a lot about the, that these words, each of these words have very significant meaning to people. So dynamic, it's intrinsic part of all people, humanity through which we seek ultimate meaning, purpose, and transcendence and experience relationship to that, to that list or connectedness with self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or sacred. And then the researchers in the group added that it can be expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices. So that just as an aside, it's very difficult, actually, the research, a lot of the research in this area have been association studies that people with an affiliation with a faith community tend to have better health outcomes. And I think if not here, I have a slide in one of the other talks, but that has borne out to be statistically significant, the public health research, but there were other types of association studies that were done that didn't quite meet the, the Cochrane criteria for research. But nonetheless, 
there were enough in the review that Tracy Balboni did, and I was part of that, as was Betty, number of people were, to show that in fact within palliative care, there is enough data to suggest there should be education, training of students, education of, of uh, clinicians, and also working with, um, with people of other expertise, such as chaplains and faith-based leaders. From the public health group, because that association between faith community attendance and health outcomes did meet, those studies did meet the Cochrane criteria. The recommendation was that people should be aware and um, they use the word spiritual. I did a little bit of nagging about that, but most of the, of the work really is around faith communities. I would like to see more done around spiritual non-faith communities too, but that there's enough data to suggest a public health that at least within social determinants of health, uh, uh, religion and spirituality should be part of that because of the power of the community. And again, I and many others see other aspects, but that's why we need to do more research that fits that kind of criteria. So part of, um, part of the work that I did with Betty in that 2009 meeting and all, all the people that came again through a rigorous consensus process was what is that clinical spiritual care model? So in, in doing this work, uh, trying to get it not to be ignored, really, I, I recognized it had to be a clinical aspect and many of my colleagues who did this work did as well. And so what came out of this conference is that assessment and treatment of spiritual distress, including spiritual distress and symptom management is absolutely essential. And clinicians need to be doing that, working with chaplains or spiritual care professionals. So identification as well, not just distress, but what are resources of strength, spiritual strength and support. And then the generalist specialist model of spiritual care was defined. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this because this leads to our initiative of advancing spiritual care. So I am a generalist spiritual care professional as are any clinicians, either online or here. And then the chaplains, the board certified chaplains, trained chaplains, would be the specialists, mostly in inpatient settings. Now, about five years ago, I would have said they're inpatient and faith community leaders are outpatient. So faith community leaders are in the outpatient setting, but more and more settings are having board certified chaplains also working in outpatient settings. And there's a difference in the training of faith community leaders, which I'm probably speaking to people that know that here, but um, in chaplains. So um, not all chaplains are clergy, 80% of Catholic chaplains are women, not clergy, um, and in, in other faith traditions too. So it's important to recognize that not all of them are faith-based uh, faith leaders, but the kind of training that chaplains get are very, very, are a little bit different from faith-based, simply faith-based seminary training. So they're getting more training in the clinical world and how to function in that clinical world in terms of diagnosis, treatment, doing a, uh, an assessment that's um, commensurate to their level of training, which is different than what we would do. So that's the, the key about that model. And if I had my way, there'd be enough chaplains in every clinical setting that we could all really function well with this. Uh, right now, um, Rick Bauer is, um, is a chaplain that works with me. He's been in Africa most of his professional life working on HIV AIDS. He is a board certified chaplain. I mentioned this earlier and a social worker. So I, he is gonna be working in my outpatient palliative care clinic, but at this point I'm calling him up. I asked the patient, yes, she wants to, or he wants to see the chaplain. I connect them, they see each other, but we do it collaboratively. So Rick comes back to me and said, you know, it's not, it's not just bereavement. The patients also have something, some real faith crises, or there's also a deep despair. And so then he will suggest ways that I can continue working with my patient. So it's really that collaborative model that we are aiming for. Um, and we do that with other, for the clinicians, the physicians on, on the call or, or here, we do that with everything. So if I refer to a cardiologist, I, I expect to hear from him or her. So I know what I need to continue doing. And it's that same sort of model that we work together. Some of that collaboration is online, like in Epic, I'll get a message with a detailed note, but there is that expectation that we're working together. So um, provision of compassionate care is a huge piece of that, um, which I talked about in the morning talk. That does take training. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just say that because it does take some time and, and 
the tight schedules that people are being fit into sometimes makes that hard to do, but takes time, but not a huge amount of time because it can actually transform the clinical encounter when we can, when we are able to do that. And then training commensurate to our scope of practice. So in that whole person at treatment plan, we would make a diagnosis or identify resources of strength. Let's say we make a diagnosis of distress. We've discerned it from physical, psychological, or social. So I always think about, is this distress uh, despair or is it also depression? So I will try to rule in or rule out depression or anxiety. Maybe it's social despair, isolation. So is it from a social perspective of being isolated? say family members during the pandemic, that was huge. Um, is that also aligned with the loneliness that we see as a spiritual distress? So, you know, this is a, a field in progress and there's more and more work being done to try to identify these diagnoses. Um, we wanna, now this George Hanzo, it was part of our meeting and so we need to distinguish simple from complex, which I always chuckle at because nothing is truly simple. But the idea of that is that I would recognize that, you know, I think right now my being able to listen to this person and following up with them is, is okay. Um, there's not a crisis versus now this is really out of my realm and I really need to work with the chaplain. Or many of my patients ask if their faith community leaders can get in touch with me, which on occasion has happened. So um, that's really, and if it's complex, then we need an immediate chaplain referral. So for those of you listening or here, know that including my own setting, we don't have enough chaplains for that. So we need more chaplains in all the in and outpatient settings. So we would write up the plan and then follow up. So this is just a case of a patient, um, roughly based on a real patient of mine, but again, for confidentiality is, is changed. Usually these cases are based on like 10 or 15 of my patients and I put it into one case, but. Um, so she was a 68 year old female and she was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Her life partner is James and they have two children, 42 and 47. She had a very bad um, hip fracture, a pathologic fracture, which left her wheelchair bound. And actually physically, when I saw her, it was clear she was in great physical pain. And that was probably the, the first thing to address. Eight to 10 out of 10, um, active all her life and you know, it's a sort of typical story. When we retired, we thought we would travel the world. And that was our dream. Um, she felt sad that her life was cut short. She said she was angry with God. Why would he do this? The why me question that I've been told by chaplains is probably the most common spiritual distress. Um, she did not want to share her deep despair with anyone. So the context here was interdisciplinary. There was a chaplain in the room, a social worker, myself, and a nurse. And... Um, you know, we went in gently to these conversations because there was a team approach, but she, she was really actually happy with that. But um, she, she, and this was in person, so her, her daughter was with her as well. And she felt reluctant to share her deep despair, but later told us because her daughter was in the room, but she didn't want to burden her daughter or anyone else in her family. So she felt very alone and scared about the uncertainty um, she was offered surgery to rebuild the hip, but they told her it would take three months in rehab. And she said to me, if, if I'm going to die anyway, is it worth it for me to be, be in rehab? There are a lot of issues going on with her. She was Methodist. It was very important to her. So even though she said she was angry, and I wrote that down as, an, as a diagnosis in a subsequent visit, she challenged me on that and said, it's actually a good thing that I'm angry with him. It means I have an active relationship. So that was interesting. But she did say, my prayer is about my anger with him. Um, it's very important to her. Um, used to meditate in the past, it helped her. Very strong community, but again, that burden, being a burden. She didn't really wanna be a burden. So, um, so she stays home. She would like to talk to the chaplain, uh, but she's a, and, and the chaplain in the room at the time said, you know, would you like to talk to your pastor about this? And she said, no, because I think he will judge me, but felt safe talking to her, to the chaplain in our clinic. Um, and then she wondered, you know, about her life and whether she did something that might've caused all of that and the grief about not being able to travel and the, the dreams of, you know, saving up until you're in your sixties or seventies and not being able to do the things you wanted to do. So a bit complex. So that, um, you know, writing up that kind of plan um, and, and I think this is so important. Our medical students learn 
to do this. And most, most medical students will learn that they have to write about the physical and the emotional. They used to write about the social and they, there is a social history that they do. They write very little there, although we're working on that. And then the spiritual is certainly part of that. I had integrated the FICA spiritual history into the social history because that was the only, that's now called the patient-centered history. I thought that would be the easiest for it. And, and, and truthfully, they do, um, they, they will do that because it's one part, it's what they learn. So, and then, you know, in that plan, family meeting to discuss prognosis, goals of care, and, and then working with a chaplain, and we continued to be present. And she wanted to, to again, reinforce her meditation practice. So spiritual health as an equal, a part of whole health assessment. Um, so we should do that with everybody. And uh, I'm mentoring someone now at Columbia University who's a primary care doctor, and she's teaching all of the primary care residents and the internal medicine residents to do this, that you just, spiritual health is part of whole health assessment. And if, if we identify spiritual distress, then we need to attend to it and work with board certified spiritual care professionals. And that's develop that whole person assessment and plan. So um, then moving on to competencies. So we, Dr. Blatt and I um, decided to develop national competencies and we did it through a, a competitive process. So we wanted to pick schools that had very strong programs and that could also, that had an interdisciplinary component, including chaplains. So we brought them together and we did one of these discovery and action dialogues. It was a four or five day conference. It was really intense. And we used that World Cafe format. And then based on the ACGME competencies, we then developed um, competencies in, in uh, spirituality and health. And then um, the schools piloted projects uh, in teaching those competencies. So everything up there is ACGME except the pink one, Compassionate Presence. So what happened at the meeting is everybody, you know, we went, we had again, very rigorous process, voting, et cetera, but none of, none of the participants could see compassionate presence. It could fit in professional balance, a personal balance. It could fit in systems base. It could fit in communication, but that didn't really sit with the people the way they understood it. So we created that its own competence. And these are just some of the examples under patient care, performing spiritual history, ongoing follow-up of distress, integrate into a treatment plan, knowledge about the research, communication, demonstrate the use of silence and patient communication, practice contemplative listening, personal and professional balance, explore the role of spirituality in your professional life, identify your resources of spiritual strength, and then system space to evaluate resources in healthcare systems and community. And then these were, and there are many more actually, I'm just highlighting some of them. I'm happy to share um, the paper it was in academic medicine. Um, but presence, that, that notion of the privilege we have to serve another, such an important piece that often gets um, neglected. And I think it's really important now with the changes that have occurred in healthcare, there's a couple of factors. One is COVID, of course, and the high burnout rate and so many, so many physicians leaving as well as other clinicians. The other is the shift in our medical system to a more business-like model and um, how people are finding that that does not align with their call to serve. They feel rushed and so a high degree of burnout from both of these scenarios. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a challenge, but as I mentioned this morning, there's data that if people don't serve um, out of the reason that motivated them to go into their profession, there's a, a greater association with burnout. And so we see that over and over and over again. So that sense of, you know, uh, before I enter a room, I think about that privilege that I have to be with that person and to earn their trust. I think it's important that we not lose that. For, and that's not just about physicians either. That's about all of us that work with, with people. Um, so and be able to describe, describe our personal and external factors that limit our ability to be present. That could be lack of training, could be time, et cetera. And then how to be able to work with that. Strategies to be more present, describe um, how you as a clinician can be changed by your relationship with patients. So many of us um, talk about that. I, I mean, for me, it, it 
I can be, I have been enormously stressed by the pandemic. Um, but the minute I went into that room, that, that was just such an important thing for me. And it continued to, and still does, give me that sense of you know, purpose and meaning. And so many of the medical students have that. And my colleagues who are clinicians have that. And to bring that into the education system to give a venue for people to reflect on that and talk about that, I think is really critical. So some of the essential elements of that competency and presence is what I just talked about, our awareness of call, um, being open to being changed within our encounters by our patients. And in reflection rounds that we did, it's really, um, really that that was so obvious from the way that patients shared about their, their patient, their students shared about their patients. So when I went in, when one of the students, when we were practicing it, actually learning how to do it, you know, he, we were in all the, about eight students were there. And then one gentleman started sharing. He says, you all know me. And I kind of become an ass. I really, you know, I'm very competitive. When I started medical school, I wasn't like that, but I've, I've really changed. So I'm going to share about a patient, he says, who was on his surgery rotation and she had a hip fracture and was older and he would go in and get the important physical aspects to report on rounds, but she wouldn't let him go. Young man, come sit next to me. I can't hear you anyway. Sit next to me. Listen to me. So he shared about that and he, he became aware of, of what he had become and he didn't like that. So he changed. So this, it's, a, it's really some of the stories that we've heard from the students are really very profound. But that means having, that means entering into a relationship with someone that we heard today from one of the questions. The, those are some of the aspects of contemplative listening. And then the, the viewing our practice as a spiritual or a significant practice, um, you know, connecting to that sacred or significant in the patient encounter. Um, also not fix it based care, but being willing to navigate those uncomfortable conversations as we talked about this morning. So we talked about being aware of our, our spiritual dimension um, in, in our professional development. So we did Jewish Templeton, Templeton Foundation uh, funded this reflection rounds where we worked, um, our team included a chaplain as well. And so we developed a tool um, for reflection that's based on what chaplains do, but it's changed. And uh, it was an opportunity for them to reflect on a patient. How were they changed by that patient? If they were, you know, was there anything spiritual or humanistic that they encountered in, in that visit? And then we, we piloted initially in eight medical schools, and then we had another uh, nine that we piloted in. Um, and there was a small group format, and each student would have about 10 minutes to share their story. And nobody would interfere with what they were sharing. Nobody said anything. The facilitators were specially trained. So it was always a chaplain, a physician, sometimes a chaplain nurse, but in our, some of our programs, they were more interdisciplinary. And um, they learned that kind of facilitation, which is to hold silent space. And that was Rosemary Doherty was my teacher for this. She was a Catholic sister and a Buddhist sensei very interesting person and her area was spiritual direction and she did a lot of this kind of work um, with end-of-life care and you know I learned from her what it meant for me to recognize when my response would have been an attempt to fix a student as we were practicing I just saw how she facilitated and she taught me a lot and really raised an awareness in me also of how I want to make things right for patients and sometimes making things right for them is to accept them and just listen to what's going on in, in difficult, especially for difficult times. So students learn that kind of facilitation um, and they actually caught on really, really quickly with the asking questions was not, you know, occasionally they would say like, I completely relate. So this is what happened to me. And then Rosemary would say, okay, I, we'd love to hear about that when it's your turn, but maybe you have a question for the person that you just listened to. So that notion of really listening, it, it worked really, really well. We had some good data from this. Um, so time to reflect in the in mainstream. And that's why we called it rounds to make it mainstream. And the mentors were chaplains and, and physician mentors. There were rituals. Um, we used a structured reflection guide only, only as a guide to help them, but they, they didn't have to answer questions. They just 
read those questions and then came up with whatever, um, whatever came. When we initially did this, we didn't have them work on it before the group. We just had showed them the guide beforehand. And then at the group, we would just take, oh, have a moment of silence and whatever came up for you about a, a patient that you just recently shared. Um, and then we had a little bit of a framework that we used for this. And then the contemplative facilitation was a huge piece of it. So now I just want to uh, close with what we've been doing recently. So Tracy Balboni and others found that inadequate training uh, was identified as a stronger predict, strong guest predictor of lack of spiritual care provision to patients. This is with clinicians. And the other one I want to point out is 50% said that spiritual care is better offered by others. So I routinely, when I work, have worked with nurses who are in the ICU, they will tell me during the day, I'm okay with doing this, but at night, there's no chaplain around. Now that we don't have many chaplains, they're saying it for both things. But since there's no chaplain around, I really shouldn't address this. And my response is always, you know, this patient is suffering. They need someone to be with them, to sit with them. You may be the best person. They may feel most comfortable. You don't have to try to fix something. So I think that's just a, a common misperception. And that's been a reason for not doing something. And I, so that's one of the reasons that we've moved on to develop this train the trainer program. So I initially piloted the program at the VA hospital in DC. And um, it's a little hard to see the competency at the bottom, the bottom but it's do a spiritual history, um, and then at the treatment plan, all of the things I talked about, practice, compassionate presence, et cetera. So we had those learning objectives and then we looked at pre and post and you can see that the majority improved from their baseline. So then Dr. Betty Farrell and I developed um, ISPEC, Interprofessional Spiritual Care Education Curriculum. How many of you are familiar with Betty Farrell's LNET program, Educating Nurses on End of Life? Okay. So I copied it. <laughs> Basically, I took her idea of developing an online course, although her first element was not online, but online, and then doing a train the trainer, which is, um, and we did this together, doing a train the trainer where we have people come to the courses. Most of it has been virtual. We will go back to an in-person this June, um, but still offer a virtual because people from that normally wouldn't be able to afford to fly, especially other countries can attend. And we ask that those train the trainers are clinician chaplain pairs. So social worker chaplain, doctor chaplain, nurse chaplain, et cetera. Um, and for the most part, we've been getting it. I, I have to push really hard. And what I've taken a, a different tack lately because I think it's easier for, clin for chaplains to find clinicians to partner with than vice versa. So for those of you that are chaplains, you actually have a really big role here. So what do the chaplains learn? I think the chaplains learn what we teach clinicians, but also they should be, the chaplains should be part of the train the trainer team going back because they model the, the, the expertise, the specialist role. So we've, that's what we've been doing with our train the trainer courses. We've got some really good outcomes. And just recently we've been working with um, a colleague of mine who's now the new George Fischetta, as everybody calls him for transforming chaplaincy. So Shava has been, is working with us and we developed a interprofessional evaluation tool so that we can look at not only practice changes from the course, but also uh, internal changes as well. Um, and we're, we're getting some interesting outcomes. That was our 2018 one. And you'll recognize some of the people to your to your left is Trace Haythorne and then Betty Farrell and Marvin Delgado and many others. Um, we have faculty Noreen Chan in that red uh, mixed top is from Singapore and she does a lot of good work in Singapore. Um, so looking Carolyn Jacobs, some of you, she's standing next to me in the white jacket, amazing leader. She just got the Contemplative Listening Award from Shalane Institute. Um, so really, really enjoy this course. And again, we've had some data from that course and we've got others that we're doing with these newer courses. We're gonna do them over the, the three year period now. But um, many people, they come in with goals. You know, I'm going to teach, you know, 20 residents or I'm gonna teach, you know, the different goals that they come in with. Majority of them have accomplished those goals. And then they've had a lot of successes in implementation, you know, with discussion groups, um, education of patients and community training, as I said, to different clinical staff, creating resources. 
So many different goals in this to highlight the importance of spiritual care. And it's really from my, just from a personal perspective in 2018, when we did this, most of the goals were around just convincing the hospital that this is important or the clinical setting, but now they're actually getting really great support letters. And I think it's really advancing, which is, which is really great. Um, then what we've done is, so our iSpec core is, we have six modules. We did develop an iSpec pediatrics. Uh, so we've already integrated it into our train the trainer. The online is almost done. We've integrated pediatrics and faith community leader information to all of the, all of the core modules, just little bits. And then, um, but then the, the unique ones are modules four and five. So iSpec FCL is also one that we're just working with Relias to complete that are around um, difficult communications, what, they're, what is being taught in terms of contemplative listening. And that was done with Carrie Doring, who's here in, in, uh, in Boulder. I think it's Boulder. So we did, um, we did get a grant from Templeton Foundation. And so ACPE and City of Hope are our partners and it's called Advancing Spiritual Care, Spiritual Health and Everyday Clinical Practice. We're, we're recognizing there's a movement. I wouldn't say we're building it. There's already a movement. There's people all over the world that are doing this. The research piece is that we had a, a call for proposals for looking at generalist specialists, a model of what a generalist specialist would look like. So there's not really a model where people recognize what happens when a, when a say a nurse does a screening how does that process work with the chaplain? Is there any feedback to him or her from the chaplain? Or when I do a history, how does that work that I would refer and, and, and looking at some, it's quality improvements, looking at some outcomes. So those are our five sites. We are calling, we're borrowing this movement. We're borrowing it from how palliative care became a field through education and training and then through demonstration projects. And then <clears throat> there were the uh, palliative care scholars as well. Soros Foundation. So we're just beginning this. It's a 10 year vision. This is our first three years um, and very excited to see. These are very diverse. I mentioned Alison Kestenbaum is, is doing work with training clinicians. She's going to be working with the AIM uh, protocol and, um, and then Mayo Clinic is a social worker combined with a chaplain. And this is in a, in a neuro um, oncology clinic. And then in Erie, it's a family medicine um, center where they're looking at um, they're looking at um, uh, how how they're going to in integrate the FICA history in the primary care setting, and how the referral with chaplains will work. Baylor Scott is in Texas, and they also have a community center, and they're doing both adults and pediatrics. So we have a pediatric representation there. And then Atlantic Health is in New Jersey. And so James Barr is actually a senior uh, leader executive there. So he's really interested in seeing it integrated. So there's really good possibility for what they do that will be integrated throughout their whole system. So very excited about that piece. So we are you know, asking people to join us. So many people are interested in the iSpec courses. We are looking to, to work with institutions uh, with iSpec and from other countries, people wanna adapt that more for their cultural setting and mention the demonstration projects. Part of the part of the demonstration projects is not just doing a project, but being part of a year and a half long learning collaborative where people will learn how to do publications, presentations, and, uh, and also advice on their research. So we're hoping that will, that will be successful. We're planning on that. Um, have a number of people that want to partner with us now, medicine and ministry actually, gave us uh, the remaining funds that they had because we wanted to honor them actually for their work in this field before us. Um, and then we have other resources as well. These have been many of our partners with GWISH and now we're of course wanting to broaden that through this, um, this project. And part of, our, part of our role and we're finishing the new website is to be able to highlight what other people are doing. So to be able to say, look, Look at such and such a university, look at this place, look at the great work they're doing, because the, getting the word out is what's going to eventually cause major system change. So that's my uh, email and that's uh, the link to the new initiative on, on our website. So with that. Good.
Thank you so much. I am interested in um, some feedback on a particular case with a family medicine resident, but before I get to my question about that case, I'm wondering if there are any other questions around education or research that you have or Jackie that are in the chat. Pressed. Yes. Sorry, gave me a chance to swallow. Um, what I was wondering, you, you had a slide earlier that said you had adjusted the CPE verbatim process to teaching medical, was it medical residents? Well, yeah, we, we borrowed a tool. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I just wondered how you adjusted it to... to so I'm not, you know, the, the person that did that was the chaplain. So she explained to us what the verbatim process was. And then she, plus the social worker and Dr. Blatt and myself and a couple of other faculty adjusted the questions to what they thought would be appropriate for medical students, right? So it's not, you know, it's, it's not the verbatim that I think you all do. So it's more the, the questions, the reflecting on, a, on how you were affected emotionally. What did that mean? What you know, what worked, what didn't work, if that's how, you know, they want to share, but it wasn't really for clinical improvement. It was really just an, a suggestion of a reflection. Not, not everybody followed those exact questions, but it stimulated um, reflection in those areas. So being changed, like the medical student who was changed by that patient, you know, recognized something in him. Um, the, the, the stories ranged. I mean, they're always really incredibly meaningful, but the, the facilitation is what's key because I will tell you when Rose, Rosemary taught us how to do this, Sister Rosemary, and um, in our first group, there was a student that was sharing about her mother who had died a few months before she came to medical school. And I looked at the clock and I know Rosemary, I, I, you know, I run over, but she never does. So I saw it was like five to seven and I thought, this is not, this is terrible. And I started panicking that she was depressed and I'm the faculty representative here and what's going to happen, la la. I wasn't being present, obviously. So I just looked at Rosemary and she just listened to her. And then she said, well, you know, it's seven o'clock. So sometimes we finish on an unfinished note. And I had a tailspin. I didn't show anything to anyone. I just thought this is terrible. Then two weeks later, we got back together. Rosemary opens up the discussion and the students say it was great to finish on an unfinished note because isn't that what life is all about? And the student said, and I was so tempted to check in with her after, but I didn't. She says, I am so grateful that nobody checked in with me. It felt good just to put it up there, right? So it's really that sort of format of they can, they can, sh and that was really humbling to me because I was this close to inter you know, interfering. So it's, it's really about how do you give people space? And what the students feedback was, so not, not so much a, an examination of how they, what they said to the patient and could they have said it differently. It's not like that. It's more a space for them to share about something like that. And many of the students said that they learned to listen to patients better as a result of being heard. From the chat, um, Melina wants, wants to know, will there be future dem demonstration project grants? And if so, what's the anticipated schedule? And what's the best ways to um, support these education um, efforts? So yes, we are hoping to, so um, the Templeton Foundation gave us funding for the first cycle of demonstration projects. And we have, we've opened the door to people if they are able to find funding within their own organizations or otherwise they, we will hold a second round. So currently we have three, um, institute, and they, they'll still have, you know, they're not going to, we're still going to evaluate the proposals as we did before. Um, but, um, you know, that, that we're going to open the door to that sort of participation. And then we are looking to the next three year cycle where we hope to offer at least one or two demonstration projects each cycle rounds. With grant money for the three, or do you always have to bring your own funding? No, we are hoping that we can raise enough grant funding so it, for the following subsequent years. Templeton gave us a challenge grant for, for this one, yeah. But we are looking, we, we have some interest and we want to, 
you know, it's, it's how we want diversity as much as possible. So pediatric, adult, different kind of settings, et cetera. Yeah. And I know some people wanted to apply for the demonstration projects, but it was kind of a short deadline. And so, yeah, we were recognizing, yeah, I know, I know. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess I'm not clear. So is there a deadline coming up again for the next round? Uh, we are, we're gonna make it a little bit later. I don't have the exact date, but we're looking right now for, you know, funders and others. And, and then we're gonna, we're gonna call that. We'll, we'll figure out how we're gonna do that. Yeah. It's probably going to be, I want to say May or June, but I don't have an exact date, so I don't want to be misquoted. Can you say a little bit more about the um, iSpec for faith community leaders, that module? Um, yes, yeah, so I can, I can speak to it a little bit. The, we did a um, survey of different seminaries and MDiv programs, et cetera. That was Trace Haythorn did that survey. And really just looking at what is currently being taught in seminaries in terms of contemplative listening, compassionate presence, end of life discussions. Let me back up a little bit. It's Arthur Vining Davis funded. And if you guys know what, uh, what Arthur Vining Davis has for years, I mean, I remember the first grant we got was in the early part of the century, very interested around clergy efforts, training clergy around end of life care and you know goals of care, et cetera. So clergy to clergy was one of those projects in Kansas. There were a lot of good projects, but they felt that they still had work to do in that area. So we proposed um, a collaborative effort between clergy and us to develop something like an I, you know, the iSpec basically to see if that could be used in curriculum. So that survey was looking at what's in the curriculum. And we found that there were not specific areas in that. And so the two modules, four and five, address that, address those areas around communication around end of life care and their role and, and what might be, there's a case that uh, Harry Doring developed on what might be a better way to communicate around some of these things from the purpose of, from faith community leaders, their perspective. So I had a, um, actually it was one of the, the uh, grants and was working with some family medicine residents. And ultimately I'm getting back to the question of teaching and receiving. And, um, yeah. but this was a, a resident who, um, one of their assignments was to engage in some kind of spiritual assessment or conversation with a patient and then bring that back. And they could write it up as a case history, that kind of thing. And most people found, I gave them FICA and, and whatnot, but most people found that what worked best for them was just an organic conversation. Um, I mean, it's good to have um, some kind of uh, an assessment tool if you're one who is anxious about that. But, um, but the, he, he and others found that, you know, it just sort of happened organically and it was easier that way, which is fine. Um, and he said, you know, I, I'm really very nervous about doing this in part because, you know, one of the barriers is I don't really feel equipped to do it. Like I'm afraid if I say, ask a question, somebody's going to come back with more than I can answer. <laughs> and um, he had a woman and her daughter who were in his office and there she had a, a tumor and had had an MRI and they were coming back in. So to hear about the tumor and what was happening. And he said, you know, they came in and I took the MRI out and he said, well, I can't really see, I can't really tell. And they right away jumped for joy and said, it's a miracle, it's gone. He can't see it. He can't see it. Oh. He said, the problem is it was just, I don't know how to read MRIs. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, his, you know, he rose to the occasion, but he also was feeling, um, I mean, it was the very scenario that somebody is afraid of is that they're going to get themselves in a spot. And he didn't know, should I say, well, no, not really. Or should I say, I, he didn't know what to do with it. 
Um, and I appreciated his honesty about it, um, but also wondered not only what might you have responded, were you speaking with him, but the other is just kind of the, the, um, the anxiety and the fear that this stirs in some people, not all people, whether they're medical students or residents or um, others who are kind of afraid to get into this topic with patients. So um, just to clarify about that case, so he, the, the, his communication was around what is on the MRI and the patient saying this, and he said, I can't see it because he couldn't actually read it and, and what to do in that, in that situation like that. So he hadn't really broached a spiritual topic yet. It's just that, what do you do with these uncomfortable? Yeah, took yeah. it in the spiritual, they just started yelling. Oh, it's a miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. It's gone. I see, I see, it's gone. I see, yeah. I mean, I, I think being honest, what I meant is that I, I don't know how to read MRIs, so I can't make a decision, but your doctor, you know, I mean, and then, and then just say, but tell me more about your faith or your, you know, what a miracle means. I think, I mean, I, I'd have to know the whole context, but um, yeah, it, with regard to what you said at the beginning, I'm also, so the FICA tool was not developed as a checklist, and this is what I can't stand some, I'm now working with Epic to have it integrated, but as they reminded me, you lose control when you do that. But there's so many versions of FICA there that are a yes, no, a checklist. Some people call it a screening. It's really a communication tool to your point. So the way that we did this was Joan Tino, who worked with Joanne Lynn at that time, Dan Macy and Dale Matthews. Um, and we got together and we're just talking about it. And there was a couple other physicians involved, but it was really very simple of how do we create a card that, you know, back when I did residency and people still do it, they have cards that remind them about review of systems or whatever it is, that, you know, and we, we spent a, a very thoughtful um, process of what is it that a doctor would need to know about a patient's spirituality. We don't need to know great depth. And so that's how the process began. And then, you know, eventually we, we did it, we validated it with more people, but the idea is just, if you need a tool, this, these are the main things that a, a physician would need to know. We don't need to know the dogma. We don't need to know all of that. Um, we probably don't really need to have training on faith development, though I do think spiritual development is important to at least be aware of, which we have in the eye spec. But what would be an opening question? So we started with, do you consider yourself spiritual or religious? I've changed that since because people lump that together. So I wanted to give it a space for listening to whatever the person considers spiritual. So if it's their pets or nature or their family or their work, you know, we want to keep it broad enough, but we also don't want to have it so broad that people who are religious feel they can't comment. So that's been the development of that tool since 96. Um, so it's an opening question. And then the meaning question came as a secondary thing, maybe six years after that, because this, that sense of meaning and purpose and connectedness is so out of the definitions is so important. And then the I is influ, influence um, and importance. So is this important in your life? And uh, how is it important? And then influence on healthcare decision-making. So I often will, if it's just an annual visit, that's when I ask about any advanced directives or goals of care, because it sort of aligns with belief systems sometimes. C is community, again, broadly defined, could be, um, faith, it could be a church, it could be a mosque, it could be a yoga group, etc. And I'll say a little bit about that when we validate it. And then A is how should I, so in the 90s, it was how would you like me as your physician to address this, that has since moved to be updated with the guidelines as the assessment and plan portion, if, if you're able to identify anything from that conversation. But back to the community, we validated it with Betty Farrell at the City of Hope, and even though the population was largely religious, when asked about what gave their life meaning, it was family or their work, or, you know, the, some people talked about the community for, for community, you know, they talked about the, the city of hope, um, or they talked about their family, they didn't necessarily talk about faith community. So, you know, it's, it's, that's why we ended up broadening to, to have those categories, but it's not a checklist. And I, I am aware that people use it that way. It's not a yes, no kind of thing. It's really a conversation tool. So you can enter in at any point. If a patient says to me, you know, my, you know, I, I, I belong to a Wiccan community and it's been so important. Then I enter it into that way. So then I ask about their community and then it sounds like spirituality might be important to me. Oh, definitely. And then to you and then you know they, they talk about that and 
would it impact any of your healthcare decisions? So, you, you know, you have to use your, it, it's just really to help them what they need to know. So at the, at the time that we were doing this, the question was, but what do I need to know as their doctor? Do I just need to know their religious affiliation, right? So it's kind of moving a little bit beyond that, but it's not a full assessment like chaplains would do at all. Is that? Just knowing a religious affiliation isn't really all that helpful because it means no. different things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I have a funny story. I met my dad was at Cedar sinai we, we lived in Los Angeles, and although I had moved to the East Coast, and I was with him for a procedure, and they were asking his religious identification. So he says, well, I'm Catholic, but that's not the main part of my spirituality. And I'm standing behind the nurse, and I can see him kind of blinking at me, and I thought, oh, boy, here it goes. So she says, well, what's, what is my, he's, well, I'm a singer and music to me is really important. And so he's belting out an aria in the pre-op area. <laughs> it's really great. But that's, you know, that's the thing is it's an opening question, but it's not limited. It's got, a, there's many facets and people understand their spirituality differently depending what's happening to them. From the chat, um, it seems like there's been great strides in education and spirituality and health. Um, what are some of the barriers? Profit in our own uh, land at um, George Washington or um, as you partner with others, what are the major barriers to, to integrating spirituality into education of healthcare professionals and community-based faith leaders? Well, one of the slides addressed that, but that was more in doing it, that time, money, we don't have time for it. That has always been a barrier and it continues to be now in this fast-paced world. So. I think what is changing it is not just our work, work it's, it's work all over that people are doing, which is looking at what is the outcome if you include that into a person's care. It's, it's absolutely the right thing to do. But I think we need the kind of data that it shows, you know, um, Mount Sinai did a great study on, on chaplaincy, for example, and it improved patient satisfaction, increased referrals to other colleagues. So, while I, I don't like to hear that that's the only thing we have to validate it, we, we do need measures for different audiences. So hospital administrators are going to be looking at a very different thing than you and I are going to be. I, for me, it's enough to say it's the right thing to do. But that's, that's not how we deal with it. So I think we have to be realistic. And that's why we included a tool that doesn't take a lot of time because time is a factor. So if you, and, and if you have to have theologic training or philosophical training to do it, it's not going to happen. So again, what is, what is appropriate? And I think data that makes the case, and I will tell you, while the data is getting better, it still is a lot of association um, studies. I think within palliative care, it's an, it's an essentially a quote, no-brainer, because we know that when people are suffering, that there's high degrees of spiritual distress. Marvin Delgado and others have done that research. So when in a population like that, it, it, we recognize, you know, there's data that's associated with high spiritual distress, with depression, anxiety, poor quality of life. And if treated, those things improve. So it's not, you know, it's, it's multifactorial, but they do improve. But I think in terms of talking across all of health, um, it, it needs to be correlated with why it's an important health measure. So there are, there is research out of family practice, et cetera, that, patients' spirituality or faith can impact their healthcare outcomes, um, including, you know, in, um, more adherence to treatment plans. I'm, I'm a little mixed on that because I think it always should be patient-centered, but I think when you build trust with someone and respect them um, and speak to them in a way that, that focuses on their choices, it, it is better. I have a question. I'm wondering how you, in, in this curriculum, address what I would call the dissonance between um, around powerlessness. I think um, much, powerlessness, powerlessness. I think much of, um, you know, the medical profession is about having answers, having clarity, as much as there's so much mystery in it too, but having the answers for a patient, a prognosis, a diagnosis, whatever that is. And then part of what you're inviting them to do is to, listen, be with the uncertainty, not know the answers, have the patient be the teacher. Uh, and I'm wondering how in your curriculum you work with that, uh, again, for me, what I would say dissonance in really philosophy of what is being taught. Do I think we're in a sort of interesting part of history of medicine 
because we have on the one hand government regulations, Medicare says that you know decisions have to be patient centered, not provided centered, et cetera. And on the other hand, we have the, you know, the money factor of having somebody, some physicians seeing six people an hour or 10 people an hour. So what are they going to prioritize? So I think, you know, what addressing spirituality is, it makes sense from the perspective of understanding who the person is. So someone, you know, I can give you stories of people that don't want to have, a, say, a knee replacement because the winter so the summer solstice is coming up and they want to do that. And they're going to do that come hell or high water. And regardless of what you say about what they need, right? So I think what people value most is going to really impact their decisions about their care and what they want to do. Um, if, they, if their provider is someone that they can trust and feel comfortable with, they're more likely to adhere to follow-up visits. Whereas if not, they're more likely to get lost to follow-up. But we need those numbers, but there's, there is data around things like that. So I think, we, I think we need to make the case from the perspective that if we truly want to adhere to all of those whole person care guidelines that, we're, that we're being put, are being put forth, we need to have this dimension of care addressed. But I do recognize that the data may not yet be in that level, but it's, but it's getting better. And then, you know, the what is, you know, it's, it's, it's how, do we, how do we build trust? That's a whole other area. You build trust by being interested in the person. There are all sorts of guidelines of being curious and establishing a relationship. So if spirituality and what matters most to people is there and we talk about it, at least highlight it, I think it is uh, overall gonna improve quality of care. You know, my colleague in New Jersey does a beautiful thing about how he talks, to, he is an administrator, but how he talks to administrators in case of making the sense from the perspective of cost savings. So if you're able to get, if you're able to align with patient and get to the point of providing good care and they're going to adhere better because the choices were made together, not top down, then that's going to save costs. Ultimately, they won't end up in hospitals. I, I can tell you personally how many patients have come to me after being at urgent cares and all sorts of things. And then they were recommended to come and see me. And in a visit, we we're able to get to the issue. So how much cost could it have been saved? That's sort of his argument. And then he sort of moves down those kind of costs. And then the third thing he says is, and basically it's the ethical and right thing to do. So I think we have to, to look at what is needed in terms of the research to make those cases, but there's a lot written about that already. Can you say a word about um, continuity? Um, in patient care and addressing burnout and um, compassion fatigue, um, moral distress, moral injury. So we have an attending du jour, <laughs> at least a, an attending per week. And it's hard to um, fit continuity, your primary care, but in the hospital um, to stay sane almost, you have to share the load. Can you say a little bit about how um, healthcare is practiced in the hospital in a way that both supports provider way of being and continuity? Well, I'm not sure that I'm an expert on this. I can tell you just from my experience. Um, I So people, because actually there's a broader, can I add to that question? Because there's a broader thing now that there's multiple types of providers that can interact with patients and patients don't necessarily see the same provider each time they go. I mean, even in my practice now, the urgent care is if you if we can't accommodate you in two days, you go to urgent care. So I, I battle that by making sure that I have my cell phone and a lot of my patients, I, I'll call them or some of the patients that are really have a lot of issues have it, not never been abused. That's how I get around it, but that's not a good model, right? So there are many, many issues and I have a lot of concern about that. I think your question is a good one. People takes time to build trust. People get into a rhythm with their provider, whoever that may be. It could be the nurse practitioner, the PA, the physician. Well, they get into a rhythm with that person. They trust them. That person knows them. It's a little easier to make a diagnosis because you know them so well. Um, so I think it makes better sense to allow for that. But as you, you know, to your point, back in, I guess it was around 1999 or 98, when there was this move to not have the physician go across the street to the hospital to see their patients. And that's basically gone now. So that's a downside actually, because there isn't that connection unless the person 
in the hospital can make the connection with the primary care doctor. But I think a lot of people, and I don't have data on this, but I'm, I'm sure it's there. A lot of people feel that they're not getting the kind of care they need. I actually have halted a lot of expensive tests that they were gonna order because this person had this 20 years ago and I kind of know what's going on. So I actually think it would be better if there was some way to connect, but practically it's hard to your other point, which is everybody is overburdened right now. The outpatient world, they're seeing, I mean, my primary care colleagues have uh, their 20 and 40 minute slots. Most of their patients are 20 minute. I'm told that that's actually generous. 20 minutes for complex patients is not, is not a lot. So, you know, we need to keep reminding and keep advocating and I think keep doing the, the research that there's probably higher costs of care when you don't have that kind of ongoing basic relationship. But I think I probably would be called old fashioned, but I, you know, I do think it makes sense in the long run if that's possible, if that's possible. Yeah. Does that answer? And then burnout, um, I mean, it's, it's huge. Uh, and it's really sad when I hear my med well, one medical student said to me, and she's fourth year this past week on the elective, that she decided based on everything that she's seen that she's just going to aim for being a 60 to 70% clinician, which means then she will have a 40 hour or a little over 40 hour work week because she sees the rest of the clinicians working 60 hours a week and she wants to be involved in raising her kids, which but you know, a lot of them are making that decision. Some are going into concierge medicine to be able to do it the right way. So I think this is an evolving conversation on a national level. Yeah. I don't know if any of the clinicians either online or in here wanna, yes. This morning that there's a need for end of life um, decision-making and um, things like that to happen earlier in, in folks' care. And I think those of us who work at the bedside, especially in ICUs, like painfully experience that need. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice for caregivers, um, no matter who we are, to uh, how, how to help get those things started earlier, get those conversations started earlier. We have so many ethical issues, I think, that arise because those conversations aren't started at an earlier period in a person's care? So I think it's a cultural change. You know, I, I, I've been saying this where, and I worked with Joanne Lynn and Joan Tino, we used to talk about this. You know, if, if you have a society who values high productivity and work and you work until whenever, you know, and, and, and that's the message as opposed to really, and, and education systems that are focused sort of on grades and doing better as opposed to thinking about those kinds of values early on. And, and, and knowing that we're all gonna die and to have that discussion. My parents are immigrants. They came over um, you know, way after World War II. I was born in the States, but I remember watching a medical show. I maybe was seven or eight years old near medical center. Anyway, I, um, my parents looked at that. They were, man, I remember this actually. They were putting a machine as a child. I remember they were putting paddles on the patient. So they were probably resuscitating them. And my parents said, do you see that? We don't want that. We don't want any of that kind of thing. And then we talked about what that meant. I was seven or eight years old, right? So wouldn't that be something to have in our culture that we're talking about with, not, not about the machines per se, but about what are our values in life, you know? And what does that mean? And that we all need to prepare for death. We never know. We never know when that's gonna happen. So I think it's more society. Not, so there have been, there have been many people, Joan Halifax is one of them, many, many people who have done a lot on raising awareness around death and dying on, in, in different aspects of life, you know, and uh, there have been, um, who is that famous producer? I'm just forgetting his name, but I was, I was part of that project that he was working on, on dying. I think it was called On Dying. But, um, you know, thinking about stories about death and dying in our life and what matters most and living life to its fullest and making decisions now while you can. So there have been efforts since, since I can think of, of people trying to have this conversation. There's a physician colleague who has on, I think her organization is called Ending Well in California. She's also uh, done a lot for television and produce, pr producing shows around end of life care. So I think the more we can have that discussion, Death Cafes is another one. You know, Death Cafes was a movement. Now it's not. Now it's kind of coming back. Then it goes. So maybe that's not the best name for it. But 
I, I think we need just among lay people, just a conversation, more conversations around this so that people can recognize that, you know, picking things that value, think about what you want to do with whatever time you have left. You know, you don't know if you're going to live into your 20s. So not, not just disease focused, but philosophically focused. I think you said something earlier in the earlier session, and I would invite those of us who are chaplains um, to take that authority at the bedside and say, what is this like for you? What are you experiencing? You don't have to necessarily have the end of life conversation or the DNR conversation, but we as chaplains at that moment do have that authority, I think, to engage Ask those questions, which can help people and families then have that con the next conversation with them. So I would say, yes, there's these great programs out there, great to learn from, but we as individuals have that, have that within us. Invite us all to begin the culture shift. Absolutely. Sorry, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of practice and probably some fails, but... So absolutely. And I, you know, I, on, um, I don't know if it's ACP, a APC or associate professional chaplains or ACPE, but I'm on, on those groups. And sometimes that there'll be stories by chaplains of, well, I didn't go into the room because the nurse was there. I didn't want to interfere. And I, I'm texting back. It, it's not interfering. It actually could be incredibly important. <laughs> Just own the space. You know, it's not the nurse or the doctor, you know, you're part of the team. And I think the, the more I, I completely agree with what, what you have to say, and also not just for the patient, but for the staff too, you know, to, to bring that sort of non-medical perspective. You know, I do that too, even though I'm a medical person, but there's more to this picture than this machine or even the, the hospital room, you know, more than the diagnosis. How do we get to know the person? I think, I think we can form a better alignment with people too. I think it's a great idea. Very good idea. I, I um, just keep ruminating on the, it's probably more a, a comment than a question to, to consider the intersection between <coughs> ethics, narrative medicine, spirituality, and medical decision-making where when we learn to listen to the self-narration of the patient and hear what their values are to not wait until we come to an ethic consult, but help making the conversation, making the conversation or guiding the conversation to the understanding of the patient's own medical decision-making rather than imposing what we think as medical establishment we can do and I heard a comment, um, a quote yesterday that says, your patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's not about what we can do, but what is appropriate to do for the patient and how to care for the patient. And we're in such a siloed society, medical society that we don't talk to each other. And then the patient is the one who gets lost in, in the process of making decisions for their lives. It's not for our life, it's for their life. Just thought on the side. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. And, and again, to move this out of not just, I mean, end of life is possible for any of us at any point, but to move it into a change of how people live too. You know, what are our values where we're going through all of this, I think is important. I had hoped that the pandemic might result in that kind of awareness or searching for that awareness, but unfortunately it's done just the opposite. So, yeah. I'm aware of the time and wanna honor that. Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking Dr. Pohalski. Thank you so much. I appreciate this very much. Our next session is tomorrow morning, and there is a link, or um, if you want to be in person, it is over in the Loprino building, and we will be with Dr. Pahalski, who's going to speak with us. Um, it, we will be in the spiritual care department. She's going to be speaking with us particularly about that sense of vocation 
and how that can hold people steady, their sense of meaning and values and their own spiritualities in this kind of work. So thank you very much.